Significant technological and scientific breakthroughs have recently revealed new facts and evidence that confirm the accuracy and authenticity of many passages throughout the Bible. Unlocking Ancient Secrets of the Bible highlights these new technologies as well as recent archaeological finds to substantiate several stories, statements, and historical notations found throughout the Bible. Each example of this is presented by accredited scholars and experts in their fields. While not a review of the entire Bible, this documentary establishes the verifiable scientific truth of certain sections of the Bible that millions have already accepted on faith, but can now prove with hard facts as well. Was the Earth created in a single moment? Could Eve actually be the mother of all humanity? And is there hardcore scientific proof that Noah's great flood actually occurred? You're about to find out as we unearth some of the most spectacular evidence ever seen. Scratched out on three continents in three languages by 40 different authors over a course of 1,500 years, no collection of ancient writings is as widely read, closely cherished, and critically examined as the Bible. But are the words in this historic book the very words of God? Did the stories found in the Bible actually take place? And is there any tangible evidence that we can actually hold in our hands that proves the Bible is true? You're about to find out. Appropriately, our investigation begins with the most famous line in written history. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But is this believable? Did an all-powerful God create the universe? What does modern science say about this question? Well, basically, you have to believe that matter has always existed or it was created. Today, the evidence overwhelmingly supports the Big Bang Theory. Imagine for a moment all that exists in the vast universe, every mountain range, every forest, every body of water, every distant planet, everything, squeezed into a microscopic point of beginning. Scientists say the universe exploded and began from that initial point. As the universe has expanded, it's cooled Anything that expands cools. And right now, the universe has a temperature of three degrees above zero. We detect this radiation as microwave radiation. Observatories at the South Pole measure the distribution of microwaves through space and provide information regarding the very early conditions of the universe. And so the Big Bang is not a theoretical idea. It's something we're observing and measuring. The best scientific evidence suggests the universe began, thereby confirming the words of Genesis. And there is compelling scientific evidence that this biblical story of Adam and Eve actually is history. Can every single human being, past, present, and future, trace their family tree back to an original man and woman? And the scientific community actually refers to this genetic atom that they have found as a Y chromosome atom, and they refer to uh, the mitochondrial DNA woman uh, as Eve, and this is referred to in the scientific literature as the Garden of Eden hypothesis. They took uh, mitochondrial sequences from a number of different ethnic groups around the globe and determined that everyone has descended from one female 
Could this female be Eve, the first woman created in the book of Genesis? The evidence is compelling. Could also go back and look at the Y chromosomes and you could trace a lineage through the Y chromosomes to Adam. And the idea is basically the same. Looking at differences in the Y chromosome sequence, scientists did take a look at this. In fact, many have taken a look at this and determined that, yes, we all came from probably one individual. Here, our investigation moves from scientific conjecture to the flesh, blood, and bone of creation. What's interesting is that uh, the apex, the climax of that creation, the last thing mentioned as created, after everything else is prepared for him, is Adam. And it says that Adam is created out of the dust of the ground and out of the breath of God. And what that tells us is that, yes, human beings are a part of creation like everything else. But it also says that we have, and that Adam had, a special relationship with God. According to the Bible, Adam was made responsible for all that was on earth and enjoyed an intimate relationship with nature. Although Adam walked in perfect harmony with creation, he was not complete. When Adam and Eve first met each other, God brought the woman to the man, and Adam seems to be ecstatic that he has found now a counterpart. And it's interesting because he finds her right after he's named all the animals. So it's fresh in his mind that there's nobody like him until he meets her. When Adam was created, he wasn't created like a robot. Adam had free will. So there was a question whether or not he would obey God or not. Ancient desert cultures highly valued the tantalizing taste of fruit. It's no accident the book of Genesis uses the image of a fruit tree to signify knowledge. They're at this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the serpent, who is named Shiny, Eve is smitten by him, and he tempts her. The serpent employed a strategy he would revisit. He questioned the reliability of God's word. And so now when the serpent is tempting Eve, the serpent says, oh, is it really true that, you know, you're not supposed to eat of any of the trees of the garden? And then Eve says, well, let me put it straight. She says, we're not supposed to eat or touch of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's the function of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God told Adam not to eat of. Here's the point. There's nothing really inherently evil about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What it involves is the question, will Adam obey God even when he might not understand the reasons why? Or will he think he knows better than God and eat the fruit? As punishment for their disobedience, God exiled Adam and Eve from the garden. They were forced to live outside God's close protection and enter the harsh reality of broken communion. According to the book of Genesis, the fall from grace initiates a time of unprecedented evil. Turmoil and violence run roughshod over the earth. Brother murders brother. This is the backdrop for one of the most controversial stories in the Old Testament, the story of Noah and his ark. When we come to the time of Noah, uh, God has been patient up to this particular point, but now he determines to put an end to sinful humanity by means of a flood. I will bring flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, and everything that is on the earth shall die. Noah obeyed God and prepared his family. 
Noah's family filled the boat with food and gathered the animals that would soon repopulate the Earth. Initially skeptical, the people of Noah's day plead for mercy. It was too late as God closed the door to the ark. The Old Testament uses the cubit as length measure, and a cubit stands for a foot and a half. And when we do the conversion from what we read in the book of Genesis, we see that the ark was really, really large. Conversions put the size of the ark at 450 feet long, 150 feet wide, and 75 feet high. But clearly, a catastrophical global flood would leave geological and anthropological imprints. And so, for evidence for Noah's flood, what we really look for is evidence of catastrophic processes, cataclysmic processes, operating on a regional, or maybe hemispherical, even global scale. And you know, the more we look, that's what we see. One thing you might expect is billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And that's exactly what we find in the geological record. A record of lots of things suddenly buried, including very large animals buried whole. How does the theory of a global flood fit with geological features like the Grand Canyon? And yet we tell different stories about its history. Now the way the evolutionist is taught to think, the way I was taught to think, the way all of us are taught to think in our, in our education is that present processes have done it all. And so you see this 18 mile wide canyon and this little bitty 100 foot river down there. And that river is, I suppose, doing some erosion at present rates, the river would take millions upon millions of years to carve out the Grand Canyon. But the creationist might say a different idea. I said, this looks for all the world like a larger volume of water came through here and carved this thing out rapidly. That would be the great flood of Noah's day. Could this interpretation of data be supported? By the way, even my evolutionary colleagues nowadays have recognized that the Colorado River would never carve a canyon like this. And mechanics of erosion are all wrong that it just wouldn't carve a canyon like this. And they have come to the conclusion also that a huge volume of water racing through here not very long ago carved this canyon out rapidly. That's consistent with and supportive of the biblical doctrine of the Great Flood of Noah's Day. Coming up. Did the original Sin City, Sodom and Gomorrah, actually exist? And are there astonishing scientific predictions in the book of Job? Genesis depicts God as slow to anger, yet quick and decisive in judgment. Perhaps no story from the Old Testament demonstrates the intensity of God's wrath more vividly than the tragedy of Lot and his family. The uh, story of Sodom and Gomorrah is about sin and about punishment. It's about um, God deciding that he's had enough of unrighteousness and wickedness, and he's going to take action, and he's going to destroy it. After a heated territorial dispute with his uncle, Abraham, Lot decided to settle his caravan outside the gates of Sodom and Gomorrah, an area known for its desperately wicked ways. Ultimately, Lot moved into the city, even as God sent messengers to declare Sodom and Gomorrah would crumble under the weight of its sin. Lot had a pretty hard time in Sodom. Here he was among all these people who, by the accounts of the story, are, are pretty harsh to strangers, and he is a stranger wanting to fit in, but not really succeeding, we can learn from that story. And so uh, when the uh, angels come to rescue him, the rest of the town hassles them. Lot's family fled in a mad panic. We get this one little piece of information that Lot's wife, for some reason, decides to look back 
just maybe in, in regret or maybe in, maybe, do I really want to leave this place? And she turns into a pillar of salt. The most obvious explanation for the destruction of Sodom would be a seismic event, a large earthquake that unleashed a lot of material. The Bible talks about a lot of fire coming down and burning up Sodom, and the evidence at that site is that the buildings burned. Archaeologists believe the ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah discovered southeast of the Dead Sea sit on a fault line. Evidence suggests buildings burned from fires started on rooftops. Geologists further theorize the pressure from an earthquake could have emitted sulfur-laden bitumen, a substance present in the area. The dense smoke reported by Abraham is consistent with a fire from such material. Sodom and Gomorrah is referenced in secondary literature all throughout the Second Temple period and into the New Testament period. It's mentioned specifically in the Genesis Apocrypha, which is one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Next, we examine a story about a man who, who wrestles with the stubborn reality of evil in the world. Not only does his response provide readers a virtuous example, it suggests an awareness of the scientific laws that govern our universe. His name is Job. Job was a man that lived uh, probably 3,500 to 4,000 years ago. We don't know exactly where he lived, but we know that he was quite wealthy, herdsman and a farmer, was very much blessed by God in terms of uh, wealth and well-being, good family, excellent reputation in the community. At the beginning of the book of Job, uh, the readers are introduced to a, a scene from the heavenly courtroom where these figures called the sons of God, later we would think of them more as, uh, as angels or as God's uh, cabinet, so to speak, come to report to him about their activities. One of these figures, Satan, acted as both eager prosecutor and willing executioner. And uh, Satan's appeal to God was, well, this man is so righteous because you've blessed him with uh, so much physical well-being and let me do an experiment. I'll take that all away and I'll bet you that Job will rebel against you. And God says, you can do that, but don't take his life. And you know the story, Satan, with God's permission and consent, brings all of these physical calamities and disasters upon Job's life. So he loses his property, he loses his family, he loses his health. He's kind of driven to the lowest level, uh, God has abandoned me, or, or, or so it seems. The book of Job presents readers with a long-standing ethical quandary. Why do bad things happen to good people? Believers in God can go through great suffering, difficulty, and trial. Uh, their lives can have havoc ruined within it. That doesn't necessarily at all mean that they have done something wrong or that God is bringing judgment. Trial and difficulty uh, are often God's way of pruning a person's character. Not only does the book of Job communicate valuable moral truths, but some scientists believe it speaks of future scientific discoveries. The book of Job talks about the beginning of the universe and how it's a beginning beyond matter, energy, space, and time. It's the first book of the Bible that talks about the expansion of the universe. And it was Fred Hoyle, the famous British astronomer, who said that the Bible is amazing in what it says about cosmology, that the universe is traceable back to an actual beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. How could a book written several centuries before the advent of modern science contain such mind-boggling information? One of the dominant themes you see in the book of Job is that it talks about God creating life in optimal form with optimal designs, but not just optimal life forms, but optimal ecological relationships. In other words, he creates carnivores to relate to herbivores 
So the carnivores are only able to kill off the weak, the dying, and the sick, or the unwary. Not so effective that they wipe them all out, or so ineffective they can't kill any. The ecological relationships are idealized. Scientists count up to 10 other scientific predictions suggested in the Book of Job. They cover issues in the field of meteorology, oceanography, the study of prehistoric animals and fossil remains. Coming up, Abraham, Joseph, and Moses. Were these men legends or proven real flesh and blood? In Job, the reader witnesses astonishing acts of faith. Although Job suffered unjustly, he refused to curse God and instead trusted God's mysterious ways. And speaking of faith, no man in the Old Testament demonstrated faith more fearlessly than Abraham. Throughout most of the story uh, of Abraham's life, his wife Sarah is barren and unable to bear children uh, despite uh, however many years they've been trying to do so, and it's really a source of uh, some frustration for them. How is it possible for Abraham to be father of a great nation when, after repeated effort and petition, his wife Sarah remained barren? The miracle of the promise to Abraham is that so many years go by and Sarah never gives Abraham a child. Uh, she's well into her 90s before she's said to conceive this child. Uh, and it's this miracle alone, the inconceivability of how a woman in her 90s can give a child uh, to her husband is the promise, once again, that God acts in history, that God keeps his promises. Abraham was rewarded for his steadfast faith. He received his long-desired son, the heir to his promise. Abraham and Sarah instructed Isaac in the way of the Lord, as Isaac served as a tangible reminder of God's faithfulness. But God was not done with Abraham. He had a further request. Abraham, confused yet unflinchingly faithful, prepared to obey God. Satisfied by Abraham's faith, God intervened to provide a substitute. Abraham, do not lay a hand on the boy. Now I know you fear God, because you have not withheld your son from me. Your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. Skeptics denied the existence of Abraham's hometown, Ur of the Chaldees, until excavations at the beginning of the 20th century uncovered a temple tower at the mouth of the Euphrates in Mesopotamia. The name Abraham appears in Mesopotamian records. Now, one of Abraham's most famous descendants is Joseph, the son of Jacob. The story of Joseph really kicks off when Jacob gives Joseph a special coat. Joseph's status as favored son created jealousy amongst his brothers. Given opportunity, they conspired against him. The brothers sold Joseph into slavery and led their father headlong into a heart-shattering lie. They told their father Joseph had died. Upon his arrival in Egypt, Joseph was sold into the service of Potiphar, a high-ranking Egyptian officer. Joseph prospered in the service of Potiphar until Potiphar's wife developed an appetite for Joseph. She wants to be intimate with him. And Joseph, of course, resists her overture. But she's so upset, she frames him. And this results in Joseph being thrown into jail. Jail was brutal, yet God was with Joseph during his time in bondage. A pivotal point takes place 
in the prison and also is related to his gift of being a dream interpreter. While he's in prison, he's there with the chief cup bearer and the chief baker. The pharaoh, troubled by recurring dreams, sought an interpreter. His cupbearer remembered Joseph and brought him before the pharaoh. The pharaoh provided Joseph the details of his dreams. Miraculously, Joseph interpreted the dreams as prophetic warnings of a coming cycle of famine. Relieved that he was able to prepare his kingdom in advance, Pharaoh rewarded Joseph by elevating him to second in command. Some critics have questioned the story of Joseph, arguing a foreigner could never achieve such high rank in the Egyptian court. But the evidence says otherwise. We do know of people of foreign origin uh, adopting Egyptian ways and, and making it uh, right up to the top of the Egyptian administration. Joseph's story is all the more remarkable as he was a Hebrew living in an Egyptian world. Now, in time, there emerged a generation of Egyptians who were unfamiliar with Joseph's good works. In fact, the pharaoh grew threatened by the ever-increasing presence of the foreign Hebrews. In a fit of frightful paranoia, the pharaoh decreed that the midwives should drown the children of the Hebrew captives in the muddy waters of the River Nile. It is out of these bleak circumstances that we get the story of Moses, the visionary lawgiver. Amram and Jacobet, the, the parents of Moses, put him in this little ark, this little uh, boat made of rushes in the, in the Nile, and then uh, led his fate up to God. <laughs> God was certainly kind because it was the daughter of the Pharaoh who picks him out of the, the bulrushes. And uh, that's what Moses means, drawn from the water. And then he became a prince in the house of the king. Moses was tutored and trained in Pharaoh's court, where he became learned in the esteemed knowledge of the Egyptians, mathematics, philosophy, medicine, and architecture. Although Moses had an aristocratic upbringing, he couldn't neglect his burden for fellow Hebrews, who were often abused and blamed for all manner of trouble. One day, Moses witnessed an incident destined to alter his life. He deserved to die like a dog. These people... Filled with righteous indignation, Moses exacted revenge. <laughs> Stunned, Moses buried the body and his crime beneath the hot desert sand. Moses is now a marked man, of course, after he had murdered this uh, taskmaster. And so he goes into the Sinai Peninsula after spending 40 years in Sinai as a shepherd, Moses had an illuminating encounter with the divine. The exodus of the Hebrews from Egypt begins with a miraculous escape from Pharaoh's feverish pursuit. The sojourn from bondage into the promised land, though, is marked by murmuring and disregard for God. Moses is called upon again to deliver a corrective message to the unruly people. Well, the interesting thing about the Ten Commandments is they tap in uh, and, and coincide with what our human reason tells us as well. Ethicists suggest the Ten Commandments appeal to a universal code that regulates human behavior. The Ten Commandments, you know, actually govern both religious aspects of life. Uh, the first three of the commandments deal specifically with a particular religion. But the other seven really are fundamental principles that every society ascribes to. Thou shalt not kill, and the prohibition on theft. The Ten Commandments stand as an ethical foundation for the establishment of future civic liberties. 
the Declaration of Independence talk about, talks about the self-evident truth that all men, all human beings are created equal and that we have inalienable rights, not from government, but bestowed on us by our Creator. Uh, and that really sets the foundation for what kind of government we have and what the purpose of government is. Coming up, who was the great hero Samson? And did he actually do the unbelievable things the Bible says he did? The world over, Moses is celebrated as a courageous visionary. In fact, according to the Bible, his encounter with God produced the moral principles on which most modern civilizations rest. Remember that Moses was born under the threat of death. Our next hero has more promising beginnings. His name is Samson. When Samson's born, his parents give him over to what's called a Nazarite vow. Um, the Nazarite vow includes many things, but one is that you never drink wine, you never drink fermented or any kind of alcohol. The other is that you never cut your hair. You know, there's nothing special or magical about the vows themselves. They're a sign of devotion to God. And uh, if Samson is supposed to be about the work of God, uh, then it would be important for him to show devotion in some particular way. In a time of brutal oppression under Philistine rule, Samson emerged as a leader of great physical strength. In the book of Judges, a judge is a military hero and a charismatic leader, somebody who shows a particular ability to fight and to lead others in battle against Israel's enemies. His physical strength found rival only in his moral weakness. Samson has one other vice, and that is Samson loves Philistine women. And this was a no-no in ancient Israel, but he loves them. And the one woman that he really loves is Delilah. Philistine lords realize how devoted Samson is to Delilah. They use her uh, as a kind of spy to find out the secret of his great power. Delilah was pressured into action. On several occasions, Delilah presses Samson to tell her why he's so strong. Samson thirsted for Delilah. And at first he lies. He does not reveal uh, the truth about his Nazarite vows. And in the end, he doesn't even quite come clean. But he tells her that uh, the secret of his power is in his hair. And if his hair is all shaved off, then he will become as weak uh, as any man. She passes this information on to the leaders of the Philistines. Uh, they uh, sneak up on him while he is asleep at her house. Samson loses his uh, supernatural strength, his God-given strength, and they were able to bind him and they gouge out his eyes. Samson gets his power back uh, really by praying for it, by showing devotion to God, by asking God. God restores his strength. Uh, Samson topples the temple. And uh, as the story says, he kills more Philistines in his death than he did previously in the rest of his life. Samson's pursuit of pleasure cost him his freedom. But the Philistines' ropes could not stifle his determination. Today, the world looks for leaders who combine the courage and strength of a person like Samson and with the wisdom and judgment of a sage. All of those qualities can be found in our last hero, David. God sends Samuel uh, to Bethlehem, uh, to the family of Jesse, to anoint David to be the next king. God's choice of David was unique because in the ancient Near East and also with the first choice of the king, what were, what were people looking for? They were looking for the biggest, strongest individual. David would soon be given the opportunity to prove himself fit as a leader. 
And of course, this is the famous David and Goliath story. David, again, is back with the sheep while his brothers are in the army fighting the Philistines. But the Philistines are technologically superior to Israel. The Philistines employed iron weapons, thereby putting Israel at a tactical disadvantage. The only strategic leverage for the Jews was control of high ground, making Philistine attack difficult. The Philistines have recourse to an ancient custom, which is a battle of champions. So they put their champion Goliath out to challenge a champion from Israel. King Saul made a declaration to his soldiers. The man who kills the giant will receive riches, his daughter as a wife, and will live tax-free. Still, the soldiers were afraid. So no one wants to fight him. But David comes to deliver lunch to his brothers on the battlefield, and he hears that this is going on, and he's personally offended that no one is willing to fight Goliath. Not because he thinks he can defeat him on his own strength, but he knows the power of his God. And so David takes the challenge uh, and does what no one else is willing to do, and that is face Goliath. David threw himself at the feet of divine fate. Now, David used a, a slingshot, and we kind of think of kids using slingshots, but these are serious weapons. Armies used them. As a matter of fact, within the army of Israel, the Benjaminites were particularly adept at the sling. The sling held stones the size of baseballs. The gifted musician called upon God to empower him. Skeptics long argued that David was a legend contrived by a band of inconsequential nomads. Until 1993, when archaeologists digging at Tel Dan in northern Israel discovered a stone slab on which David's name is inscribed, thereby becoming the first archaeological reference to David outside the Old Testament. David became the most celebrated king in Israel's history as his lineage carries the blood of earthly royalty. Coming up, what did scientists dig up in the 1960s that proves the Bible's accuracy? Over 400 years passed between the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and the arrival of a religious teacher whose birth, life, and miracles would soon serve to shape the course of human history. Was this teacher, Jesus of Nazareth, simply a good man, or was he sent directly from the right hand of God? Let us take a look at the life of Jesus as recorded in the New Testament Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Our question for the experts is, are these Gospel accounts reliable? The reliability of the Bible has been repeatedly uh, proven and demonstrated. Many people try to find uh, contradictions in the Bible, but there really are none. I have yet to encounter any historical evidence that is contrary to what's found in Scripture, what's found in the Bible. To me, the Bible uh, really is impressive in terms of its historical accuracy. As archaeology continues to uh, uncover new evidence uh, and as more manuscripts are discovered, the whole trajectory is that the biblical authors were very reliable in how they presented the history. The usual rule is the farther removed you are from events of the first century, the hazier it ought to become. Because of archaeology and because of 2,000 years of excellent biblical scholarship, the opposite is taking place. We're getting a clearer, and clearer and sharper image of what's happening. 
There is no historical evidence that disproves the Bible. In setting out to examine the reliability of the Bible, what kind of proof will we require? Very often when we talk about proof, people are thinking in terms of a mathematical proof. They want it as solid as 2 plus 2 equals 4. But historical evidence doesn't add up the same way a math problem might. Evidence in history often relies on the quality of the testimony. So the question must be asked, how did we get these stories about Jesus? Where did they come from? Everyone agrees there was a period of orality when the gospel stories were passed down orally from community to community, mouth to mouth, if you will, as opposed to being written down, and that that process took a few decades. But it was in a Jewish context in which they were used to reciting prayers that they had memorized. If this story about Jesus and his teachings had not been important, they would have been lost a long time ago. So they passed on these traditions. People heard Jesus tell a story. They saw Jesus work a miracle. They remembered, they shared, they turned that story over in their minds. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1960s provided scholars an opportunity to measure copying accuracy. The scrolls, believed to be from the first century AD, contained an excerpt of the Old Testament book Isaiah. Scholars compared the Isaiah fragment with next available copy from the 9th century. The results are startling. 99.9% .9 same text in both. So this idea that the copyists have, you know, totally changed scriptures just does not work. And it really is a pretty worthless argument. There are non-biblical accounts of Jesus, and these are very important. In fact, some scholars have actually demonstrated that you can get the basic story about Jesus by not even looking at the New Testament. To the surprise of some, Jesus is also mentioned in other religious texts. When we look at the broader field of religion, and we consider writings from the Muslim world, the Quran, or up from the larger Jewish world, the Midrash, Talmud, that we discover that Jesus is also featured in those writings as well. Coming up, what proof is there that Jesus actually lived? And is there any evidence that he actually performed miracles? Now we turn our attention to the contents of the Gospels. What kind of person do they portray? What do they tell us of Jesus himself? The Gospels are biographies, but they're not biographies in the modern sense. Modern biography depends upon first-hand accounts, tape recordings, video recordings, writings left behind by the subjects. Just what kind of person do the Gospels portray? Non-biblical legend has Jesus traveling as far as Egypt and India during his early life. But the next image we get of Jesus in the Gospels is at his baptism. Jesus arrives at the Jordan River in order to be baptized by John, a religious zealot whose scraggy appearance and fiery preaching made him an unpopular outcast. According to the Gospel accounts, Jesus' baptism initiates a three-year period of preaching and healing. He led a relatively normal life. He worked, he studied, he attended parties like wedding feast at Cana, where he apparently left an everlasting impression. Jesus and his disciples arrive as guests of a wedding. Ancient weddings are similar to modern weddings in several ways. There's a real strong sense of reciprocity uh, in the ancient Near East with weddings, where people would give very lavish gifts to this new bride and couple, and they expected a great party in return. Mary, Jesus' mother, responsible for the meal, arrives at an embarrassing truth. They've run out of wine. Yet Jesus' response hints at his divine purpose. He then tells the waiters to fill up these stone jars 
with water. He doesn't tell the waiters to look the other way or to leave the room as he, as he brings a vial out or a potion and dumps it into the water. He merely tells him, okay, go ahead and start drawing the wine, and the water becomes wine. Archaeologists have found pieces of large stone jars of the type the Gospel says Jesus used when he turned water into wine at a Jewish wedding in the Galilee village of Cana. This church at Cana is believed to be the site of Jesus' first miracle. Coming up, what did archaeologists uncover that definitively proves one of the Bible's most notorious women really did exist. The Gospels tell us that as Jesus walked the region healing the lame and preaching the forgiveness of sin, an evil plot against his cousin John the Baptist was unfolding. John the Baptist had apparently offended Herod Antipas, the ruler over Galilee, and Herodias, his niece and new wife, by publicly denouncing their relationship as wicked. Herodias conspired with her daughter Salome to silence John the Baptist once and for all. Herod's birthday celebration provided a perfect occasion for their devious plan. Evidently, the floor show was dull, and so his dear second wife, Herodias, in order to liven things up, uh, had her dancing daughter, Salome, come out and do some sensuous dance, which evidently turned Herod's head. And so he says, uh, ask what you will, and it's yours, even to the half of my kingdom. And so Salome, instead of doing the logical thing, asking for half of his kingdom, asked for the head of John the Baptist, who was in prison at that palace. Herod honors his oath by providing Salome and her mother Herodias the head of the slain prophet. Equally startling, recent archaeological digs have shed light on the reliability of this gospel story. New Testament also give us an important evidence about Herod Antipas in connection with the story of beheading the head of John the Baptist, which was apparently here, although the story is legendary, but the palace of Herod Antipas and the dance of Salome was exactly here on the remains that I'm going to show you. Because we found the pavement. The dig conducted in northern Israel in 2006 proved to be historic. Perhaps you are the first uh, camera team to take the picture of it. First whatsoever, first in history. Now, when we excavated the foundations of the basilica, of the reception hall, we were completely surprised to find remains from the first century AD, even from the beginning of the first century. And we found beautiful marble floor made of different colors. And we dated it by pottery and by uh, coins to the first century, and since marble was so expensive, and since all the parallels for uh, marble come from Herodian palaces, I'm almost convinced that this uh, floor was part of the famous palace that Herod Antipas built, and that was the background for the famous dance. Evidence from the field of archeology span lends the gospel accounts a measure of historical credibility. According to the Gospels, Jesus continued to preach and demonstrate his power over nature. He used this power to ease the suffering of the people who believed in his message. Jesus was an itinerant preacher who often moved from town to town so as to spread his message. According to the Gospels, his journey brought him to the pool of Siloam. Blind from birth, the man visited Siloam in the hopes of receiving a miracle. The Jews believed an angel might appear at the pool, stir the waters, and offer divine healing. 
According to the Gospels, the man believed in the possibility of healing and received it at the hands of Jesus. But is there any evidence that such a place existed? Well, of course, the great good news now is just a little bit further down the hill at Silwan, one of the suburbs of South Jerusalem, they've discovered, of course, the magnificent entrance to the pool. The Gospels depict Jesus as exercising authority over several aspects of nature. Each miracle Jesus performed raised his profile and further convinced his disciples that he was the Messiah. Among Jesus' miracles, one of the most spectacular, of course, is the stilling of the tempest. One day, Jesus and his followers were out on the Sea of Galilee. Although familiar with the sea, a terrible storm whipped the disciples into a frightful panic. And in the midst of this, the disciples are panicking. The breakers are splashing on the bow of the deck. They're afraid their ship might break up. They rushed to wake Jesus from his sleep. Jesus rose to calm both the storm and their fears. Again, this is a very strong statement of his authority that all of creation must respond to his spoken word because he is their creator. But are the basic facts of this story credible? The Sea of Galilee is a very interesting place. It's actually in a bowl, and so they'd have violent windstorms as the wind would shoot through the mountains and it would create very scary nautical situations. One of the most exciting recent archaeological discoveries took place up in Galilee where a boat that Jesus and the disciples could have used came to light in the spring of 1986. The boat could hold 12 to 15 people, the amount suggested in the Gospels. The boat had a sleeping section consistent with the Gospel account. Coming up, startling new evidence that the crucifixion of Jesus was an actual historical event and eyewitnesses that claim the resurrection really happened. The tragic events of the final days of Jesus' life parallels the outline mapped out by the Old Testament prophets. The passion of Christ, as it is called, has captivated billions for centuries with its heartbreaking depiction of Jesus' final hours on earth. Over the years, many have become skeptical about the story of the passion. Some claim it's, it's infamous characters such as Pontius Pilate and the, and the Jewish high priest Caiaphas never even existed. Others suggest that the resurrection was an elaborate hoax. What do our experts say? The last four days of Jesus' life, commonly referred to as the Passion, is said to be the most intriguing yet controversial part of the Gospels. In the days leading up to his crucifixion, Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. As he passed through the city walls, spectators rushed out of their homes to greet him and shower him with palms ripped off of trees. This would later become what we commonly know today as Palm Sunday. Word of Jesus' arrival spread quickly to the Jewish high priests of Sanhedrin. They saw the popular Galilean as a serious threat to their control of the Jewish people. Caiaphas, the most skeptical and cynical of the Sanhedrin, conspired with the rest of the council to put an end to Jesus' ministry. In the story of the uh, trial of Jesus, there's this fellow Caiaphas, the high priest. In the early 1990s, a significant archaeological discovery was made in an excavated tomb within the city of Jerusalem. A series of small boxes called ossuaries were found. Once the body of a loved one had completely decomposed, the family would gather the remains and place them inside one of these bone boxes. And in order to remember whose bones are put in 
which box, they would scratch the names on the end of the box. So when this tomb was excavated, they actually found the name Caiaphas. Among the bones they found in the box were those of a 60-year-old man. The name and date inscribed on the ossuary remarkably matched the description and time of Jewish high priest Caiaphas from the Gospels. So do we have the bones of the high priest Caiaphas, who was the person mentioned in the trial of Jesus? Very likely. On the first night of Passover, Jesus sat down with his 12 disciples for the Passover feast in what has become known as the Last Supper. It is at this fateful meal that Jesus revealed to his apostles, according to the scriptures, he was to be betrayed by one of them. I would begin with my thinking about the passion with the Garden of Gethsemane. Shortly following the Last Supper, Jesus arrived at the garden with three of his favorite disciples, Peter, John, and James. When Jesus uh, went to the Garden of Gethsemane after the Last Supper, he went up there to pray. The Garden of Gethsemane was a quaint olive orchard that laid at the foot of a large hill outside Jerusalem. As the disciples slept and Jesus prayed in the still night, Judas crept into the garden along with a soldier dispatched from the Sanhedrin. Judas prearranged with the soldier that he would mark Jesus with a kiss of death. Judas. Seize him. Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin at Caiaphas' house. There, a mob had gathered for a clandestine trial in the dead of night. Jesus admitted to the Sanhedrin that he was the Son of God. They got it. They wanted to stone him for blasphemy after that. Jesus was then taken before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, to be condemned to death. Pontius Pilate is a historical character, and we know he's a historical character. This is one of those cases where we have corroboration for his existence and for his job. We know where he was and what he did. Experts agree that there is a mountain of evidence that proves Pilate was the governor of Judea at the time of Christ's death. We actually have an inscription. It was found back in the 60s by an Italian uh, excavation crew who were working in Caesarea the excavation crew unearthed a stone that was part of a fourth century staircase. However, when they overturned the stone, they found that it had been reused and was actually from the first century. When they turned it over, they found part of an inscription, and there very clearly on the inscription you can read the words Pontius Pilate and his position as the perfect of the area. One of Pilate's duties was the production of currency for the region. We also have coins that were minted by Pontius Pilate. We know the dates when Pontius Pilate was the governor in Judea, and we know the dates of these coins. So by putting those two things together, we can know that we have coins that were minted by Pontius Pilate. For many centuries, no record of the spot where Jesus was tried before being crucified had been discovered. It was here that Jesus was sentenced to be scourged. After they stripped and beat him, the soldiers placed a crown of thorns upon Jesus' head to mock him. They then led him up the hill to Calvary, pushing and kicking him as he struggled to carry his own cross. This chilling execution site had the foreboding name of Golgotha, place of the skull. Coming up, could Jesus possibly have survived his brutal crucifixion and merely pretended to rise from the dead? 
or is there scientific evidence that proves otherwise? We've all seen the crucifixion of Jesus dramatically depicted in paintings and acted out in passion plays and films. But how does one go about this traditional form of barbaric execution? We have lots of literary evidence of the use of crucifixion. Jesus was not the only person to ever be crucified, but it was relatively common. It was a horrible execution and usually used for what considered to be particularly horrible crimes. The cross used in Palestine at the time was most likely what they call a Tau cross, and what he would carry would be the horizontal beam only. The vertical part was already in the ground. As Jesus struggled to climb the uneven, rocky streets of Jerusalem, his physical condition deteriorated. Jesus was close to death, in effect, when he was carrying the cross beam up to Calvary. As the blood volume goes down, the blood pressure goes down, so the heart rate increases. And we can see evidence of this as Jesus is carrying the cross up to Calvary. He is unable to take it all away. Once Jesus reached the top of the hill, he was thrown on the ground and his arms were stretched across the horizontal beam for nailing to the cross. Contrary to popular belief and depictions of the crucifixion, the spikes used to fasten Jesus to the cross were not nailed through the hand. A nail through the palm of the hand could not support the weight of the body. It would tear through the flesh and then that he would fall off the cross. They were driven at the base of the hand, just below what we would call the palm, and there's no way the person could free themselves. Not only was the wrist a good, solid anchoring point, it was also a way of maximizing the pain as a major nerve passes through the carpal tunnel into the wrist. That nail, as it's driven through, crushes the median nerve, which causes excruciating pain because it's worse than you bumping your elbow or your funny bone. Well, that's nothing compared to what would happen if you imagine just bumping the ulnar nerve, how much worse it would be if you took a pair of pliers and crushed the ulnar nerve. Every time Jesus pushed up to relieve the weight of his body so that he could breathe, the nail would rotate on the raw end of the nerve, causing incredible pain. As the Romans raised his cross in the air and fitted it into the hole in the ground, his whole weight would be pulling on those nails in his wrists. Literally is an excruciating experience, and that word excruciating comes from the Latin, which is ex crucio, out of the cross, ex crucio. And so the pain involved is just absolutely enormous. To ensure that the man remained on the cross and to make it even more difficult for him to push up and breathe, the Romans nailed his feet to the vertical beam of the cross. Archaeologists made a startling discovery when they found the ossuary or bone box of a man in his 20s named Ioannin. Carbon dating of the bones proved Ioannin lived and died at the same time as Jesus. When they began to take the bones out of the box to organize them, they found something very unusual. In the ankle bone of this man was an eight-inch nail that had been driven through his ankle, and there were portions of wood on it to show that it had also been driven into wood. This archaeological discovery provided historians with physical evidence of first century crucifixions. The whole process was designed by the Romans to cause the maximum amount of pain, the maximum amount of humiliation, and it is actually the most horrific form of execution ever devised by man. Skeptics believe that Jesus actually survived his crucifixion and that he faked his own death in order to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. But because of historical records, we know for certain that would have been impossible. Now, some people try to say that Jesus swooned on the cross and somehow got off the cross alive. Well, first of all, if a person who was being executed by the Romans was not dead at the end of the process, 
the people in charge of the execution themselves would be executed. But secondly, from everything that I've described about the medical process, there is absolutely no possibility that he could have survived that. He was absolutely, positively, absolutely dead at the time he came down off the cross. Any idea that is otherwise is completely absurd. Coming up, a new religion is on the rise and its believers are willing to die for their beliefs. Is this proof that the New Testament is pure and irrefutable fact? After confirming his death, Jesus' family and followers were anxious to give him a proper burial before sundown and the start of the Sabbath. A wealthy man named Joseph of Arimathea asked Pontius Pilate for Jesus' body so that he may honor him with a traditional Jewish burial. Joseph had recently contracted for his own tomb to be carved out of a large rock, and it is there that he laid Jesus to rest. A first century tomb is easy to spot. We have many examples, archaeological examples, of first century tombs. A heavy wheel-shaped stone was rolled over the entrance to the tomb, and a Roman guard was placed on duty as the Sanhedrin were concerned that Jesus' disciples would steal his body and claim he had risen from the dead. They were sealed on the front. They had a very small opening in the front, you had to bend over to go into the tomb, and the first thing you saw was a big room, an ante room, and then you saw other rooms that led off to the sides where burials would take place. On Sunday, Mary and Mary Magdalene brought spices and oils in hopes of anointing Jesus' body, but when they arrived at the tomb, they discovered that the rock had been rolled aside and the tomb was empty. Mary and Mary Magdalene were startled by an angel who told them that Jesus of Nazareth had risen from the dead. He instructed them to alert Peter and the disciples that Jesus will meet up with them in Galilee. Women were not considered to be reliable witnesses in a court of law. It is unusual then that the first line of witness and testimony to the resurrection of Jesus comes from the women in the Gospels. The testimony of a woman in the first century was not even valid. It was worthless in a court of law. If the early church was inventing the resurrection, it surely would not have chosen women to be the first line of defense. It is almost a sure thing that the tomb was actually found empty. The original Jewish polemic against the, the uh, resurrection assumes that the tomb was actually empty. Having risen from the dead, Jesus first appeared to Mary Magdalene. Master! Later, he appeared to two strangers who didn't recognize him. He walked along with them as they told the astonishing story of this simple carpenter from Galilee who was wrongly crucified. Jesus finally appeared before his apostles, who were stunned and could not believe their own eyes. After Jesus was resurrected, he appeared to people. He appeared to Peter, he appeared to the 12, he appeared to 500 at one time, and he appeared over the course of 40 days. A lot of people say those were hallucinations. It's impossible according to psychologists today. Another key piece of evidence to the story of the resurrection is that believers and witnesses maintain that Jesus ascended into heaven in the face of persecution by the Sanhedrin. Within a few short weeks, they are in the very streets of Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified. They're in the very streets of Jerusalem defying the religious leadership and proclaiming the messiahship of Jesus and the resurrection. The disciples were transformed from doubters who were afraid to identify themselves with Jesus to bold proclaimers of his uh, deity and his resurrection. They're on the streets and they're preaching that Jesus has been resurrected and they're willing to experience persecution and ultimately death for that. Many of the disciples underwent brutal persecution for what they believed to be true. The apostles uh, 
undertook great risk uh, to share Christ. They were persecuted, some were martyred. Stephen, for example, was stoned to death. Some were beaten and left for dead in the hopes that they had been martyred, but of course survived. By their own confession, they did what they did because they were convinced they saw Jesus alive physically after his crucifixion. All four Gospels break off with Jesus ascending into heaven, but only Luke's Book of Acts shows what happens in the intervening segment between the end of Jesus' ministry and the birth of the church. The stories in Acts chronicle the beginnings of the church, starting with the apostles who knew Jesus personally. But in time, the seeds of faith spread across the earth influencing beliefs in all parts of the world. Here we have the record of how all these little molecules, you might say, of the faith got seeded and how they grew into what is today the most successful single phenomenon statistically considered in the history of the world. Luke, the evangelist, is credited with writing the book of Acts. Luke's precise technical writing style authenticates his authorship. Now, Luke was a doctor by profession. He was a very educated and erudite man. And if you look at the language of Luke and Acts, it was written like a, a Greek classic. The nice thing about the book of Acts is the absolute realism. It's first-rank history. But can we really believe what Luke tells us? Are the events described in the book of Acts a true account of the times? Or were the stories embellished, even fabricated, simply to advance their message of Jesus? Was it all just an elaborate hoax? It's not even the critics of Christianity believe that's the case. They might believe that they were mistaken, that they may have had spiritual experiences, but certainly not an intentional hoax of any sort. And then to expect that they went on to the rest of their lives uh, propagating this hoax that they knew was false, and then eventually many of them were martyred and tortured even before that. That is a, almost a greater miracle than to posit the idea of, of Jesus' physical resurrection. As the apostles' preaching began, winning new followers of Christ from Jewish communities, many Jewish laws were altered or abandoned. This dramatic, dogmatic shift is startling to historians and further proves the accuracy of the accounts. It is quite striking then, when you look at the practices of the early church in a Jewish context, as well as moving on into the Gentile world, where significant aspects of the Jewish beliefs and practices were altered in the name of Jesus. Circumcision isn't as important. Uh, eating with Gentiles is okay now. Eating foods that aren't kosher is okay now. You also have the uh, transference of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. These are drastic changes for a Jewish group of people. The only way to explain that is that something happened. Does this Jewish conversion phenomenon give credence to the scriptures? Many believe that their change was only possible if Jesus had actually been resurrected. Rather inexplicable if Jesus uh, had remained in the grave. It makes a lot more sense why these Jews would make these huge shifts if they actually encountered him alive after death. Something would have had to have happened in their midst of, of monumental proportions. Although their message was changing lives, the apostles soon learned that spreading the gospel came with a price. It wasn't long before Christian persecution began. Just like Christ suffered to make the gospel possible, the apostles suffered to make the gospel available. They were persecuted horribly for the stance that they were taking with regard to the resurrection of Jesus. Now, I don't know about, <laughs> about you, but if it were me, at some point I would say, uh, stop, it's a lie. We made this all up. But they didn't. They died for this. This is one of the reasons the gospel is very likely to be uh, true and authentic is because here were people willing to give their lives for something they believed in. The first to fall in the name of Christ was a young man called Stephen. Stephen was a deacon in the Hellenistic or Greek-speaking faction of the early church. 
He was a servant, he was an administrator, he was to be a peacemaker, and ultimately became a martyr. They dragged him in before the council. Stephen gave an impassioned speech. Eventually they took him outside and they stoned him to death. Coming up, is there proof that the monster turned martyr, Paul, actually traveled to Malta and Rome? This tragic martyr's tale has a peculiar twist. One of Stephen's persecutors, a man present at his uh, very execution, would go on to become the most important member of the early church and the focal point of the Book of Acts. He was a, a Pharisee from Tarsus, and to the early Christians, he was the epitome of cruelty and intolerance. His name was Saul. He was a real flesh and blood man from history and is credited with writing a large percentage of the New Testament. Saul's passion for the Jewish law induced pure hatred for the apostles and all they stood for. His persecution of Christians made him famous and his brutal methods made him infamous. He was known to the early church as a bloodthirsty persecutor. And Paul's biographer, Luke, also tells us the same thing. To stop the spread of Jesus' message, Saul wished to shackle the Christians in chains and transport them to Jerusalem as prisoners. His siege would begin in the city of Damascus. So he was traveling to Damascus and almost to the city, and suddenly a light shone from heaven all around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but get up go into the city and it will be told what will be done with you there. So he did get up, but he found that he was blind and he had to be led into the city. They brought him to the house of Judas on the street called Straight. And then the chief Christian in Damascus, his name was Ananias, was told to go baptize him. And of course, Ananias must have said, you've got to be kidding, Lord. <laughs> Here's the chief persecutor. But then uh, the Lord explained, he's gonna be my missionary to the Gentiles. So he did. Baptized by Ananias, Saul regained his sight, changed his name to Paul, and dedicated the rest of his life to serving Christ. He would challenge the religious convictions he once fought so brutally to protect. But was this dramatic conversion plausible? Was a vision of the risen Christ the reason behind Paul's sudden transformation? Something turned him around from being an arch enemy to this arch proponent of, of the gospel. To explain why he would do that is very, very difficult outside of some sort of uh, theory of, of schizophrenia or some other sort of psychological problem. According to historians, the reported locations of Paul's conversion are traceable to this day. You can go to Damascus and you can still see the street called Straight. In Arabic, it's called Darb el Mustaqim, the straight way. They will even show you what is presumed to be the chapel of Ananias where Saul received his sight. Through persecution and misunderstanding, the apostles pressed on, and in time, their message captured many hearts. Churches began sprouting up all across land as communities gathered to worship the new Messiah. But still, these new Christians had some serious questions about Jesus and his teachings. They need to know how their lives should be conducted, what their faith should be, and even though they've gotten this by oral tradition, it's good to have some written documents that remind them and reinforce them of this. Sometimes there were big theological disputes that were raging in the church. Paul and the apostles faced this problem head on, crafting a series of messages that would become the Book of Letters. These ministerial missives would prove nearly as influential as the Gospels themselves. The letters, the epistles, were written to answer very practical questions that were arising in the various churches in regard to how to live the good Christian life. 
Coming up, ancient art is evidence of St. Paul's journey to Malta described in the Bible. As the letters and teachings of the apostles spread among the people across the ancient world, the seeds of Christianity sprouted. But for Paul, his fate would be far from flowery. Like Stephen before him, his tireless preaching of Jesus' death and resurrection brought about his own arrest, trial, and execution. But not before Paul journeyed here to the island of Malta, where, according to the Bible and historians, he performed some of his most miraculous deeds. In the Roman Empire, preaching Christ's message meant gambling with your life. Paul was eventually arrested, and the reasons for his arrest uh, are probably uh, very complicated. Jewish authorities would have wanted Paul arrested because Paul and the followers of Jesus were emerging as a very powerful new religion and were threatening and competing with Judaism. The Romans would have wanted Paul arrested because the Romans remembered that the founder of Christianity, Jesus, had been tried and killed as a criminal. So Paul would have been arrested for what we would call both religious and political reason. But even as the cell doors slammed behind him, Paul's ministry did not end. He continued drafting letters and preaching the gospel to anyone who would listen. He was able to speak with even greater authority, writing from prison, because now he was a prisoner from Christ. He had nothing to gain personally, but only additional hardship and suffering by proclaiming the gospel in prison. Recent archeological findings in Israel verify the details of Paul's prison letters down to the very design of his holding cell. And the two holding cells represent beautifully the life of St. Paul in Caesarea, in the prison. It was a shock to find it. It's a beautiful discovery, because it may explain how uh, St. Paul was able to write his letters in the prison. These ruins bring Paul's letters to life, confirming the description of his encampment and reinforcing the authenticity of his story. The windows faced the street on the other side of the wall, which mean that the prisoners got their food and supply from their relatives or friends from the outside world. And if you read the story about St. Paul, this is exactly the case. Paul continued this cell block ministry until finally deciding to appeal his case to the ruler of Rome. This would send him on his most hazardous journey yet. He appealed to Caesar, saying, I am a Roman citizen and I have this right to appeal to Caesar. And so he went through this appeals court and eventually uh, was sent on a ship to Rome. And travel wasn't exactly safe in this ancient period, particularly uh, by sea. So Acts 27 has the story of a very perilous sea journey that Paul undertook uh, while he was under arrest. And while he was on this ship, a violent northeaster, as they called it, came down and caused hurricane-type storm. And so again, you have these seasoned sailors who are on this boat. They are frightened, they are scared, and they are convinced that they will die. But then Paul has this vision in which an angel tells him, don't worry, Paul, everyone here is going to live. So eventually the boat crashes against some rocks outside of Malta. Everyone grabs a piece of scrap wood, they paddled to shore, and everyone lived, and that prophecy came true. While the ship's crew made their repairs, Paul began spreading his message to the Maltese community. Reportedly living in this cabin, known today as St. Paul's Grotto, Paul preached the gospel to the islanders who had never encountered Christian teachings before. Paul takes advantage of his downtime, so to speak, and preaches and proclaims the gospel. As entranced as the Maltese people became at Paul's words, his deeds astounded them even more. The scriptures state that Paul began healing all the sick in their community, and he himself survived 
a deadly snake bite right before their eyes. But that wasn't the only impression left behind. Scholars claimed that this image, a portrait of the baby Jesus and Mary, was painted by the Apostle Luke during his stay with Paul on the island. Pilgrims have flocked to this spot, called the Grotto of Our Lady for centuries. Many claim this painting is undeniable proof that the disciples were indeed shipwrecked here. But whatever the relics signify, there is no denying Paul's influence on the island of Malta. His conversion of their community demonstrates the true power of faith. But Paul's final obstacle was one even he could not overcome. Upon arriving in Rome, he was living on borrowed time. Following two years of imprisonment, Paul would stand trial before the Emperor Nero. And as a final testament to his extraordinary faith, Paul would be executed by beheading. And the relics of that sacrifice, the beheading column and a bone from Paul's arms are kept here at the church of St. Paul's shipwreck in Malta. The parishioners of this church, along with all the Christians of Malta and everywhere else Paul's influence has spread, are a living testament to the life of this hallowed disciple of Jesus. Paul's influence on modern Christianity cannot be overestimated. What we have to say is that without Paul, we would not know Christianity and the church as we do it today. The Acts and Letters of the Apostles are more than a collection of missions and missives. They provide concrete evidence tied to historic and geographical records which proved the validity of the disciples' journeys and the faith that guided them past overwhelming obstacles. In the midst of that persecution, the church is established and becomes, in a very short period of time, this dominant force in world history. These writings aren't just important to history. Passing through centuries, empires, and languages, the Acts and Letters of the Apostles remain vital and impactful to this day. Contrary to the Bible's detractors, recent scientific discoveries have actually provided more evidence to support the Bible's authenticity and accuracy than to discredit it. It was science that led me to recognize that a creator must exist. The reliability of the Bible has been repeatedly proven and demonstrated. Many people try to find contradictions in the Bible, but there really are none. According to the testimony from our experts, it appears that the Bible is actually enriched with facts and may very well be historically accurate. The question remains, however, should Bible stories be counted as history or legend? Only you can decide. However, our quest for truth will never be over. Like life itself, it is to be continued. Thank you for watching.